What's happening riot starter tv we are in the building please understand batting down the hatches get ready we are live live and direct as always um here it is here we are on your favorite platform black power media if it's your first time stopping through make sure that you subscribe to black power media this is truly the people's channel you know so um <sighs> it's been a long week and as always Whenever we bring Riot Starter TV to the um, to the airwaves, we want to make sure that we give you something of substance, and because we prefer substance over style, we want to make sure that we um, educate, inspire. You might get a little bit of entertainment because we got jokes. You know what I mean? But you're definitely gonna get some fly guests. And you're gonna get some information that you probably never heard before. Um, today is no different. Today, one of the people that um, I'm going to have on today, one of the folks that I will go on record as saying one of my heroes, because when I was fighting early in the game for the freedom release of political prisoners, we had our political prisoner posters, and this particular um, fighter was one of the folks on the posters. And, and as you all know from previous shows, we've had uh freedom fighters who you've mentioned you've heard us mention that we never imagined even getting out because there was a time when there were hardly any pps being released so this particular um freedom fighter is one of those folks but before i get to her i want to um yesterday there was a hearing for our, our brother umia abu jamal uh as you know he's been on the platform three times so far and we were hoping that we would get some good news and have some type of inkling of a time that he would be possibly released. Um, my co-conspirator, uh, road dog, uh, fellow freedom fighter and troublemaker here at Black Power Media was on the scene in the courtroom yesterday, the brother, Dr. Jared Ball. So he's gonna give us an update on what took place in the courtroom. Let's see if Dr. J's hit. What's happening, my man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. what's up, what's up, what's up? Uh, uh, always a pleasure to join you here at the Riot Starter. Shout out to the to the, to the to the remixers and those who are here live and those who will see this later. Appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. And yeah, yesterday was yesterday was wild. Um, uh, in, in honor of the, the guest I know you got uh, coming up, uh, I'm very anxious to hear from her myself. The, the, the the short of it is uh, what we could expect, unfortunately, happened and uh, the process took over. And tomorrow, by the way, on, 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 on my show in the morning, we're going to get into a deep dive. I've invited guests who were there yesterday to join me and us um, to, 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 to get more into it. But the short of it is the judge, Judge Clemens, dismissed Mumia's lawyer's attempt to get Mumia a new trial. And I thought in a very condescending I mean, her delivery was slick, you know, uh, 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 kind of a fly black woman judge um, in style and presentation. And she's clearly intelligent and uh, uh, very friendly in her delivery. But it, it came with no less, you know, the level of damage, you know what I mean, in, in, in terms of the result. And she was saying basically, and I thought in a condescending way to his lawyers, you all didn't come correct. You didn't prove your point. And, um, and and I'll stop here by sharing one example of how I think it went. And then we can, you know, you can, you know, we can determine how long you want it to go. But at one point, Mumia's lawyers presented evidence that showed that up until 2019, 
his side of the 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 defense had been denied uh, by the prosecution, by the state, uh, access to evidence of, well, two things primarily, uh, paying witnesses for their testimony and for uh, using race to cancel out jurors in an illegal fashion. To the first point, you know, when you hear the presentation, you sitting there, you like, man, how can they not? It's like, well, Mia's about to have a good day. Then the prosecution gets up and says, so yes, you say you found evidence that we paid witnesses, two in particular, who who we, as we've discussed on this platform numbers of time, a number of times, could not have seen what they said to have was said said to have seen. The prosecution just stands up and says, the state stands up and says, um, we have a policy, a standing policy to compensate witnesses. Wow. So what's the issue? So what I'm hearing listening to that is them saying we have legally formalized the process by which we corrupt witnesses to make them say what we want them to say. And from their perspective, they're saying that's so not what? evidence against us. Yeah. And it's right. So what? And the judge just sat there and said, I'm bound by the laws of the state of Pennsylvania. And by by and you haven't shown anything to show that those laws have been broken. And they basically said you had, you know, he should have, you know, he's basically it was another, it was the legal version of why are you bringing up old stuff. <laughs> they were like, wow. y'all should have figured this out a long time ago and handled this a long time ago. And since you didn't, right. just oh, well. like all the other, you know, back to the, you know, back to square one or whatever. So that's that's what it was, man. And uh, Noel Hanrahan has put out a, a recent, I think within the last few minutes, a, a really well put out statement summarizing it. We're going to go through that tomorrow. I would yeah. encourage people to check that out as well. She was there, of course, and uh, um, you know, and we'll just keep keep with it and and try to you know, no doubt, no doubt, keep so, keep focused on it. Yeah, and we're definitely looking forward to uh, seeing what 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 uh, unfolding more because you know. Just what you said in the last couple minutes is is I I don't even think it's insane you know it's it's um in the words of uh Chairman Fred Hampton man uh, it's terrible but it's fine right you know I mean? we already I, I think the surprise and the shock would have been them actually granting him a, a new trial that's when we'd have been surprised and shocked however it would, it was a moment for moment of political education because there's so many folks who still think that because your name is Lucretia or Leticia, as in the uh, state's attorney up in uh, New York, that um, that that it means something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I think I mean the judge's name I think is Lucretia Clemens. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, she was she was you know, uh, and like I said, her whole demeanor. We watched. Unfortunately, we had to sit there for three hours of her presiding over black and brown people going to various stages of of surveillance and incarceration, but. But uh, uh, she's got a very cool, you know, friendly demeanor. And it was just like, it was just like, you know, get your medicine served, with, you know, in a, in a brownie or whatever. Because, I mean, it was real sweet, you know, sounding, but it. <laughs> hey, man, ne neocolonialism adopts with time and it's the time. You know what I'm saying? It, it has to be. No question. It has to be hip hop. It has to be fly. You might get a, a judge with a natural. You know what I'm saying? But oh no, she had her braids. I mean, whatever you know, it work went into the braids. I mean, she had her whole law clerk staff, at least no doubt. you know, majority, you know, fly sisters. I mean, it was a whole, you know, she was all in power. It was a beautiful thing. And then she sat down and did what power does. <laughs> like like your man Jamil, H. Rap Brown would say, they have uh naturals on a on a on their head and perm minds. So anyway, with that being said. Also, quote me, Ma'am Jamil, to be black is necessary, but it ain't sufficient. With that being said, our guest today, Sylvia Baraldini, serious freedom fighter, um, been putting in work for decades and is still on and on, former political prisoner, uh, a veteran freedom fighter, shall I say. And um, we're, I'm just going to start with saying we are honored to have you all. Anyway, right on. take her off. Welcome. You, Sylvia, welcome to the platform. Your, mm -hmm. your mic's on and it's an honor to be on the platform yes 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 man um i don't know you saying you're honored to have us on the platform mm -hmm. but I, I was i was telling my man dr ball before the joint 
came on before we linked up, I said, man, you know, I feel like a, a fan. I'm really getting to a point where I'm a fan of the fighters. And I, I guess it's always been that way. And I say that because there's so many people out here that look to quote unquote entertainers. But to me, to know that there are folks who have given their lives and did not falter and un under pressure, you know, we, we acknowledge and we love. So definitely appreciate you uh, for your services, they would say. Right on. You know, when it all happened, it didn't seem so, it was natural. I don't know how best to say it, but it was the outcome of a lot of years of working with the, with the uh, New African Movement. Uh, and uh, it, it flowed. <laughs> it wasn't, uh, um, it's really at times hard to explain to people today when the, when the situation is so, so changed in some ways. Um, but um, it really was uh, the next step that had to be taken at the time. You know, and I, I, I'm, I'm so, because this is something, what you're saying right now is what we say all the time. Folks ask, you know, how are you able to fight in, under these conditions and situations? And just what you said, it is natural. You know what I'm saying? It's not any uh, uh, supernatural, metaphysical. It's, it's this is how it's supposed to be when there's oppression, you should fight oppression. Now, in saying that, here it is, you are, and, and an Italian uh, uh, woman joining us from Rome right now. Um, and you fought on behalf of and, and joined uh, movements, new African movements, and also uh, uh, Puerto Rican liberation movements. You were part of the May 19th coalition. Um, tell us, like, how did you get involved coming from Italy and coming to the United States? What got you into, um, into I don't even want to say activism. What got you into freedom fighting and organizing? Um, I came to the U.S. very, very young. My parents emigrated for economic reasons. And um, when I reached college, actually, my first contact uh, with uh, the movement was the last year of high school in Washington, D.C., when the, um, it was 1965 and the Selma Montgomery Ma March happened. And we had uh, a group in, at our house school that was called Friends of SNCC. And they organized uh, white, the white students to go to the march in solidarity with what was happening. And it actually is the first overtly political thing that I did is I went home and I told my father I want to go on that bus. I want to go on that march. My father, up until that moment, had been uh, fairly progressive and uh, he was opposed to the war in Vietnam. So it wasn't a big deal in our house to be opposed to the war. But when it came to black people, a whole other side emerged and uh, he told me I couldn't go. Uh, so, and I didn't go. I hadn't gotten to the point yet where I would say, too bad, I'm doing it anyway. But uh, so there was this beginning of interest in politics, um, in being active, but it really was a moment in a high school, the last year of high school. Then when I went to Wisconsin, uh, clearly um, the war and the anti-war movement were at the center stage. And um, immediately I, I joined what was at the time uh, the committee to end the war. And the first thing I did, which sort of tells you something about my personality, I didn't study a lot, I didn't read a lot, but I participated in the civilian arrest of the commander of the Travis Air Force Base, which was the base near Madison, Wisconsin. 15 of us tried to get on the base to arrest the commander of the base. And I was one of the 15. So um, it went from there. But I think the two things that began to point me in the direction where I finally ended up were in 1968, there was a big black, what was called on campus, the black strike. All the black students went on strike. 
um, demanding uh, open admission, demanding a black studies programs, uh, demanding uh, integration on campus because uh, being the state of Wisconsin, being a state school, the number of black students at the time was really small. I think the total in a student body of 33,000 people was 300. So um, <clears throat> I mentioned the black strike for two reasons. One, it really changed the tenor of the politics on campus because for the first time, it just wasn't about the war but it also had to deal with the, the contradictions inside the US. And particularly since it was primarily a white campus, what were white people gonna do about the demands that the black students were raising? And frankly, the reaction was not very positive. Um, there was a lot of friction and that was a lesson too, uh, because uh, there was not an immediate acceptance, one of the leadership of the black students and two of their demands. But this, I'm not talking about in general, I'm talking about within political people, white political people. And that was a lesson right there, very important because it, it, it brought about the fact that within the movement there was racism, the question of privilege, the question of who we were and what our resp responsibilities were. The second thing that happened at Wisconsin that for me was fundamental was the fact that a person you mentioned more than once in the programs I listened to, a person that you uh, clearly admire, Fred Hampton came on campus more than once because Chicago is not very far from Madison. And, um, and he made an effort really to organize support for the party, support for the program of the party, and uh, thanks also to uh, what he did. A lot of us went to Chicago during the, the trial of the Chicago 7, where he spoke a number of times outside the courtroom. And uh, so when on December 4th, word came that he had been uh, assassinated uh, for a number of us who had, uh, I'm not, who had had political uh, contact with him was a big deal. It was a big, big deal. And um, it, I think, is in consequence of that that I dropped out of the university and moved to New York to work on the Panther 21 trial. Um, and, and really working on the Panther 21 trial was the start of a long history to work around uh, the issue of political prisoners, in particular, uh, and for a number of years, uh, Afro black political prisoners. Because then uh, after Assad and Sunniata uh, uh, were arrested on the Jersey Turnpike and Zaid Shakur was killed, a group was formed called Friends of Assad and Sunniata. And, uh, given that I had met Zaid during the trial of the Panther 21, because he was very important to the political organizing, the one outside the courtroom, went on outside the courtroom. Um, I joined that group and we started explicitly as white people talk, starting to talk to other white people about why the Black Liberation Army, why uh, we needed to be in solidarity, what did it say about what was the United States? Um, and out of that work, uh, a whole set of relationship developed, but also a whole set of, um, of uh, thinking about white settler colonialism, about uh, our responsibility as white people, not based on being good or being, but what was our responsibility if we were gonna be, um, what was it called at the time, mother country radicals. And <laughs> that's an old term, right? <laughs> but this yeah, is what yeah. it was. Yes. And, um, and uh, it's for my personal development, I think for everyone uh, who was involved in the group, it was a very important uh, period because it really laid the foundation 
for uh, looking at the U.S. in a fundamentally different ways. Mm-hmm. And if it was, if I can add something, I, I followed what happened after George Floyd really intensely, as much as I could from being on the other side of the Atlantic. But some of the things that emerged post George Floyd reminded me very much of that period then, because some of the same issues reemerged with a lot of force and a lot of more, it seemed to me from as an outside observer, a lot more um, audience and acceptance of certain concepts that in the 70s was much harder to 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 find that kind of wide, broad support. I don't know if that's true. I was saying in the heat of the response uh, to the various uh, murders that have gone went on in that period and continue to go on today, um, if that's taken root, but it did remind me of some of those uh, struggles in some ways. I want to um, just ask real quick um, mm-hmm. because you, you said that you moved to New York to support the Panther Twenty One. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it's one thing to say you were, you were going to support the, the Black Panther Party, but you're saying, "Look, I'm going to support the Black Liberation Army. I'm going all the way in." Um, I'm sure that uh, your friends and family must have thought you were out of your mind. Um, you know, to to go that deep. You're talking about folks like Daruba and Sekou and 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 and, and, and others who um, were the first person I wrote to actually and established a political relationship was Sundiata. Mm, Sundiata. So I was really happy when re- recently he finally got out after I I think I counted right 49 years in jail. Right, right, right. Yeah, but uh, but I echo that 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 interest in the leap. I mean, because if you're talking about a comparison from the post George Floyd moment, I, my humble, you know, limited view suggests that, that not many have been willing to make even the step towards the black Panther party, much less to the liberation army. Uh, uh, So I find, I am fascinated personally also on, on even what those conversations might've been like with your, your family, your peer group, as you explain to them how you were making that important step? Um, Okay, I'll be honest. There was not much communication with my family in that period. My father died uh, and my mother, who uh, I have to say this uh, for her, that defended me through and through once I was arrested. Um, her position basically was to me, okay, you're radical, you know, but why don't you just fundraise for them instead of doing what you do? (laughs) She was trying to minimize the damage. She wanted you to be an ally, not a comrade. (laughs) Yes. But um, what I wanted to say was that when I moved to New York, uh, the Panther 21 defense was organized on two levels. One, there was the committee that took care of the fundraising, that paid the lawyers, that dealt with the lawyers, that dealt with uh, organizing people to go to court. And then there was a small group called the April 4th Movement, which was made of white people. And our job, because I belong to that little group, Uh, was to try to organize political support and solidarity, especially amongst young white people. So we had very little to do with um, the uh, day-to-day defense of the people in jail. We, we, We were intent on mobilizing, uh, a massive support uh, amongst white, especially white youth for the Panthers, because we understood that the only way uh, that people could be found not guilty if there was the kind of political pressure present in the city that made the verdict that then came very possible. 
because the, if everybody remembers, the jury was out for 20 minutes and came back with a unanimous not guilty verdict. And, um, and, and that, was ve that was an important distinction. And, and the party worked both with the defense committee that took care of certain business and I also worked with this group that saw itself as organizing um, political solidarity because it was very clear to us uh, that it was only uh, by uh, establishing a different kind of relationship with the black movement that there could be any progress on a, if you want to call it, white front. <laughs> so um, even uh, uh, around the question of women that rose in that period, or the question of gay liberation that arose in that period, the issue always was what kind of relationship and solidarity uh, would be established through the work with the Black movement, the Puerto Rican movement. Clearly, uh, the Mexican and Native movement was a little harder because physically they were not really present. But, and, um, and that was uh, uh, that that uh, putting the work in that in perspective, I think, uh, really helped link one stage to the next. But I have to say another thing because um, there were very heavy times, and um, uh, I think at times uh, experiences that are not necessarily intellectual, or uh, but that you live, uh, have a <clears throat> determining uh, uh, determine how you look at the world, and I have to say that the two uh, things that I remember from, uh, from that period that really made me think about what was the United States all about and what did we need to do was the, um, the two funerals that I attended for the BLA members. One of them was Feynman Myers. The other one at this moment, I don't remember the name, but seeing sharpshooters on the roofs of Harlem, um, buildings, when people were entering the funeral home and being there uh, ready to shoot at people who were going to a funeral really was an important experience for me because it made me think it confirmed something that I'd understood uh, when uh, Fred was killed. And something that I've heard you say on the program that I listened to beforehand uh, that uh, the state does not permit any uh, dissent that is in dissent that can be channeled in a certain direction. Once you step out, you're the enemy and that's how you're dealt with. Hmm. And so um, when uh, I was first approached and I was first approached to say something like, something like, we have a problem, can you help us out with the problem? Um, it seemed, like I said before, natural to say, yes, I'll help you out with the problem. But it wasn't an approach, do you want to join this? Do you want to do that? No, it was more a more soft approach. We have a problem and we, and we think you can help us resolve it. Will you do it? And, and, and that made it even easier as far as I'm concerned, because it was something limited that I, as a white person, can do, and I understood very well understanding um, race, racism, and um, in the U.S., that being white for me made it very easy. But if a black person did the same thing, it would be very hard. And I think that, and and I think that was the question in practice of what privilege is all about and in the organization of the US. And, and, um, and at the time it seemed uh, absolutely the right thing to do. And, and when I came back to Italy, I had to, uh, I had to, to explain two things that people didn't understand. One, 
people thought really I was a member of the Black Panther Party. And I said, no, <laughs> I, by definition, <laughs> let's put it that way. I couldn't be a member of the Black Panther Party, but I didn't didn't necessarily even want to be a member of the Black Panther Party because I had another role. I had um, the role that we had to organize where the problem was. And the problem, as many have said in history, was not in the Black community, but the problem was amongst white people and how power is organized in the US. And, and we had a crucial role to play. So that's, that was interesting to me. The other thing that was interesting to me is that people really thought that I was innocent mm. and that I'd done nothing. So I spent all this time in jail for having done nothing. And so I had to explain to people that that was not true, that, that it's not true that I did nothing. And I had to explain also why I'd done it. And um, and and I have to say that, that Amongst the many reactions, um, amongst them, uh, there's a lot of uh, pacifism in the left in Italy. So a lot of people objected to the issue of uh, armed struggle on the principle that you, the, the struggle should be built on a pacifist basis. But other than that, no one raised why did you do it since you were a foreigner or why did you do it um, because... I, actually, because I didn't live in the U.S. as a foreigner. It's true, I never chose to become a citizen because I felt uh, I didn't want to be a citizen of the U.S. in that way. But I didn't feel like I was out, an outsider. I felt totally immersed in the contradiction and the struggle in the U.S. So that's, that's, that's it, it's true once I was a prisoner it did help me that I was Italian. Yeah. This, as this is part of the record, I would never gotten back to Italy if if I hadn't been Italian. Right. Right. But that is a downside too, because clearly uh, it was um, I'll never be able to come back to the United States, and that at times um, is is a weight. Hmm. Did you have something you want to ask there? No. Oh no no no! I was just just kind of enthralled by the what what you were saying, and, and if and I you know one question that did come to my mind was really what I consider to be the Daruba question, which which when you said when you made your point about guilt or innocence, in this sense, protesting your guilt, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, I, I you know. You know this whole thing about uh you know that deruba has raised in the past around people using the argument over guilt and innocence as an approach to free political prisoners and his response at times being don't don't claim someone is innocent because it then takes away from the political agency the consciousness they brought to their actions and to the clarity that they brought to their own behavior you know easy for me to say not having been locked up uh for any you know ser serious length of time but uh, uh, that did sort of, you know, it did occur to me, to, you know, when, when you said that, it, that popped into my mind to, to, to maybe ask you to, if you had any thoughts on that approach or even the concept of, of someone having done uh, uh, that work being defined as guilty or innocent. Um, I really have come to believe uh, that whether people are guilty or innocent is not the point. If they belong to the movement, the movement has to take responsibility for them and get and struggle as hard as they can to get them out. But the other point that I was trying to make with people <clears throat> is that I don't think repression is irrational. I think repression happens for a reason. And so the people might not be individually guilty. There's people who've been framed, it's true, but there's a reason why they've been framed. And so when I talk to people, I try to explain that repression is not an irrational business. And it's, and it's important to me that they understand that the repression was heavy because what people were trying to do, not because it's irrational. 
otherwise there's no explanation why I would end up with a 40 year sentence. I might have gotten 10, yes, but 40 is um is uh a little out of the ordinary, let's say. Of course, that was one of the first really long sentences. That we've, they've been a lot longer since then, but it was one of the first trials where people were... And actually, our trial was interesting. I was in trial with Sekou, and... Um, hey, Kent, before, before you go there, can you... Uh, because folks, many of our folks who are checking it out, aren't familiar with why you ended up on trial. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we're talking, we know, but can you kind of, you know, from, from 71, you had the, the Panther 21. How did you end up being, um, um, let's talk about that, the charges that were brought about and how you and Sekou and others ended up on, tra on trial. Okay. I said in 73, I joined this group called the Friends of Assad and Sunniata and, um, through that group established a number of relationships, very important political relationships. One of them with Dr. Mutulu Shakur, who at the time was the head of Lincoln Detox and uh, Lumumba Shakur and um, a number of people who, who really uh, pushed us both to organize actively within uh, the white community, but also uh, take uh, responsibility and become allies at all levels with the black struggle. It was a gradual process. It didn't happen overnight. It took a number of years. And in that, in that whole thing, uh, something happened in the white movement that, that had important uh, for a number of us, uh, ramifications, which was the attempt of the weather underground to come out of clande clandestinity and a whole critique de that developed around the white privilege involved in that, the possibility that they had to be able to do that while there was a war going on against the Black Liberation Movement, because there was a war going on against, and there were a number of people that had been on trial, um, very important trials, you know, uh, not only Asada and Sundiata, but I can, uh, Herman Bell, uh, Jalil, uh, Jalil, I think his trial was in San Francisco, but there were a number of trials uh, that had to do with actions that were happening in that period and what did it mean to surface while all that was going on and what was happening to the resources that uh, the organization had or didn't have. In the middle of all that discussion, uh, clear, clearly uh, an argument was made that uh, considering uh, the racist society, uh, structure of the society in the U.S., white people could play a role of a solidarity, um, concrete solidarity in um, helping out the people who were um, defending the community from the police, doing a certain type of actions, even fundraising, because we don't have to be naive. <laughs> you need money <laughs> to make uh, a move, to make a certain things work. And at a certain point, there was a whole mobilization um, around. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember the formal name because the memory is going. Uh, but there was a whole public mobilization around black people. At, at the United Nations. And the idea surfaced that uh, on the occasion of that mobilization, what happened if uh, Assad was liberated, who had been convicted uh, with uh, shaky evidence against her, uh, who had been kept in terrible conditions uh, of imprisonment in New Jersey, she had had her daughter uh, under terrible conditions uh, in the basement, if I remember, of a men's jail. I mean, the situation was uh, was critical. 
and it was proposed that um, in in occasion of this mobilization to the United Nations around the Black liberation struggle, uh, Asada be freed, and uh, and that, as far as myself is concerned, I will say it's the first overtly political uh, action at which I participated. And it was also the main charge against me because I, I was a public person and, um, and uh, there was some criticism about the fact that as a public person, I shouldn't participate in, in, a, in that kind of an activity. And uh, the direction that it was going at the moment that I was arrested um, uh, two years later was that I was less and less active at that level, but more and more uh, supposed to be engaged publicly in, def in defending, politically defending what that level was doing. Um, did I answer the question? Yeah, I, I think I the no, question. No, it, it, no, it, it was perfect, but I think you were, you, you started to talk about uh, you ended up on trial with Sekou. So yeah. how did we get to that point? Um, okay, uh, there was a um, the, the day there was this uh, major major uh, robbery in uh, Rockland County, New York otherwise colloquially known as the Brinks robbery. And that same day, uh, there was an auto accident um, uh, that revealed to the FBI who had been investigating, we know from what emerged in trials, a number of actions and things uh, that revealed something to the FBI more, very, very important, which was that what seemed like uh, actions done by black people and were done by black people. But when they were looking for people, they would only see uh, white people. So um, um, the day of the Brinks robbery, this thing came apart because three white people and a black person were arrested together. And you know, when the light bulb goes off and it clicks, um, this happened, I think, for the FBI and the Special Terrorist, Anti-Terrorist Task Force. And that started uh, a major investigation that went on for, I don't know how long it went on, but for years. There were one day in prison, I, I was bored, so I started to count the number of trials that people were involved in directly or indirectly. And I came up with eight, but I don't even know if... Uh, so the repression was very heavy. Um, it was led by the Joint Terrorist Task Force, which was made up by the FBI and the what was called the Red Squad or parts of the Red Squads or uh, uh, the, of the New York Police Department. I was arrested by them on the street corner near my house. I was going to the United Nations when they arrested me for a celebration of the liberation movement in South Africa. And uh, they hunted down, I was arrested, other people were killed. Um Tahari, who was arrested with, who was stopped with, with Siku, was killed. Siku was tortured and ended up in the hospital. So th that tells you something about how the justice system works in the US right there. Um, I think from the beginning, um, this I think slightly surprised them. I was offered uh, that if I cooperated, I would be let go or I would, uh, and I refused. And I think in the beginning, this uh, surprised them because they hadn't understood uh, how profound the political relationship was. Um, they tried to play their cards, but it didn't work. And, um, and so uh, they started torturing people. 
they certainly tortured Siku. They tortured Sam Brown, which was the first person arrested on the day, the same day as the robbery. And by torturing people and by uh, other people, um, they finally started building their puzzle. But the big uh, coup for them uh, at the level of uh, being able to uh, really bring an indictment, because before then they didn't have much, was the fact that uh, Tyrone Risen uh, turned and testified against everybody. I think he testified in all the eight trials. Mm -hmm. And he was their, their key to uh, putting people in jail. It actually didn't go so well for them because in my trial, um, Siku took a political stance and didn't even defend himself and just gave a long uh, rap about his history, af what he had done in Africa, why he come back to the US, why he was a freedom fighter and all of that. Um, and this was after he was tortured. After, yes. Shout, shout yes. out to Sekou, who we've had on here several times. But go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no. And uh, and the jury uh, really uh, had a hard time convicting people. Because we had something like 30 counts, and they convicted, I don't remember, if 26 counts. And found and convicted, on, not guilty on 26, convicted on four. So it was a majority black jewelry. And uh, I think they were very aware as being a New York City jury of what was going on in the world. And uh, um, really, I mean, Siku and I got a lot of time, but I always think that um, that especially Siku and what he said in the courtroom was very important for the people sitting on the jury. Hmm. That, that's, so it was a political... I'm not in favor, I should say, I'm not generally in favor of uh, um, a legal defense. I much yeah. appreciated the Siku's uh, stance, but also for example, the stance that the Puerto Rican political prisoners did, declaring themselves prisoners of war. I think, I think it makes it uh, a lot clearer why, um, what the struggle is all about and what your posture should be uh, uh, in front of uh, the repression. I also understand that when you're facing 60, 70, 80 years, and you think you have some arguments that um, defending yourself is not necessarily absolutely um, out of the question. I think this is an issue that each, each person or each collective or each group has to uh, decide for themselves. Right on. Now, I mean, I, I got a, a thousand questions to ask, but for the the the, the uh, um, interest of time, I'm not going to ask you all 1,000 right now. But uh, <laughs> I want to. Um, so you all go on trial. I know that as far as the um, trial we, took two years. Trial took two years. Okay, okay. Now, as far as the the, the this is from the Brinks. We had a terrible or, judge. Uh -huh. I, I want. I want. We had a terrible judge. Okay, okay. And what was the judge's name? Judge Duffy. Okay, one of well, the most racist people I've ever had to deal with. Well, if I could respectfully say, may he rest in piss about that. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you co-signed that. Um, we we talking about, you know, because you had uh, a maybe like four charges, I think. So you're talking about the Brinks appropriation. We're going to call that appropriation. We're not even going to call that. I was never charged with Brinks. Okay, you wasn't charged with the Brinks situation. No. I was so charged with aiding and abetting association and stuff, but my two um, concrete acts were uh, the liberation of Asada yes. and an attempted robbery that really never happened, but Tyrone Risen said it had, so they used it because under the RICO Act, they needed um, two acts to, to convict the, the person of 
association or conspiracy and then participation in the conspiracy right so yeah so you are where you were charged with rico so um mm -hmm. uh, so we were the second group of people charged with rico right in right, the right. history of the u.s that were political that's crazy that's crazy um you know so okay so with the brink situation it was matulu and maryland buck and and and, and others on they that. were in other trials though our okay. trial was myself Sekou, uh, bilal suni ali yeah shout out to bilal as well yes yeah. yes jamal yeah. josephs okay jamal yes chewy ferguson okay and a young woman, I don't remember her name. I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. Um, mm, but uh, I think those were it, the people who were. Um, Chokwe Lumumba was one of the attorneys, and he defended, if I remember correctly, Bilal. Siku represented himself. That's why he spoke. Yes. Um, um Two lawyers, one of whom now is a judge, represented Jamal and Chewy. Um, and um, the ones convicted of Rico was myself and Siku. Okay, so you were sentenced to what, 43 years or? I was sentenced to 40 years and then I got another four because I refused to testify in front of the grand jury. But hmm. that grand jury had to do with the Puerto Rican independence movement and particularly the FALN, so, which was so, active in those years in New York, if, if people remember. So, so yeah, so let's talk about how you got those charges. So you were a grand jury resistor, is that what you're saying? This mm -hmm. was, uh, okay. The so, last four years of my sentence were for grand jury resistance. I refused to testify in any way. Hmm. Oh. Myself and my roommate actually, So, but she was only charged with, um, resistance to the grand jury because after I was arrested, clearly they um, they searched uh, my apartment, our apartment, my roommate and I, and um, they said they found a document from the FALN. Um, frankly, uh, my, my roommate was active in the Puerto Rican solidarity movement so that she would have a copy of the document was no surprise. Right, right. But the police said that it was an original copy. It was not um, um, was not at Xerox or it was not a was it was not a copy. Right. And right. Um, but it didn't matter because that position, which in those years had been a struggle to establish that the position that in front of the grand jury, people didn't testify because the point was to protect the movement and to protect uh, the organization and to protect the politics. So uh, if you were called to the grand jury, you, you were supposed to refuse and take the consequences. So when, when they realized that people weren't gonna talk in front of the grand jury, Instead of uh, not, uh, because refusal to testify in front of the grand jury was not a charge. It was not a criminal charge. Right. So then they changed the strategy and they made it into a criminal charge. And so the four years extra is actually the, the sentence that we got for refusing to testify in front of the grand jury that was dealing with the investigation of the Puerto Rican independence movement and the FLN. So you you get these charges and you don't fold, you don't bend. So um and they, they ship you off. I was not happy, I will admit that. Right, right. right. I was not a happy camp. <laughs> I didn't I think you were just <laughs> celebrating. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> no, yeah. it took me a while to it really took me a while. And I have to say the people who visited me in that period were patient because I did not take it well when right. it was 44 years. Mm. I'm, I think, I almost think that's normal. It took me a while to, 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 Process. to get into the right frame of mind. Let me, let me ask you this, because here it is, you have these 44 years and um, you know, you're sentenced 
and I'm sure as a as a European woman, um, the state was absolutely displeased with you. They must have looked at you as the biggest traitor. Um, you know, I'm sure the names and everything were, were there for you. Um, I, I want to know, you know, because I know that um, <clears throat> I, I want to talk about your time during prison. I, I know that uh, they had you in a uh, women's high security unit in uh, in Lexington. Uh, yes. Can you can you can you speak about that because I think that's very important because I think that sometimes folks think that um, okay they're political prisoners they're locked up they're just getting letters uh, the people think they're cool and if they get out then that's even cooler talk about mm -hmm. your time during this uh, okay in the, in the first uh, immediately after we were uh, um, sentenced I was shipped to the west coast where I didn't know anybody. And I was put in this prison that was a little bit of an anomaly of a prison because it was an experiment. Men and women were together. It was very relaxed. Uh, it, it was in Pleasanton, California. And that lasted about two years. And then uh, one morning they came and got me and um, I was moved to this underground unit in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, we were not the first, in the, in the underground unit, there were three of us. Alejandrina Torres, uh, who was a member uh, of the FALN, Susan Rosenberg, who was a co-defendant in one of the trials, uh, the VDA trials. Uh -huh. And um, uh, she was never tried, but she was charged, and myself. Um, uh, we, this was not the first time that the BOP, the Bureau of Prison, had selected uh, women political prisoners and put them in uh, a regime of isolation because two of the members of the FLN women uh, had been at uh, Alderson in a special little unit made just for them. Uh, so that hadn't worked. There had been incredible protests, especially on the island, but also within the United States. So at a certain point, because this is a little bit of the tactic, you try something, if it doesn't work, you refine it, you try it again. So we were the second generation of women to be put in isolation. I think the thinking was that because we were women, we would cave in. But I think they got the, the, the psychology of females wrong. I'll put, confused, that, I'll put so. it that way. Right, right. Uh, so um, what happened uh, in, in that isolation was that we eventually got sick after almost two years. We all got sick in different ways. But um, the ACLU and a number of the churches and on... Um, a number of other organizations uh, sued on our behalf, and we ended up in uh, in uh, <clears throat> district court in Washington D.C. in front of this black, I would say, progressive judge who ruled against the Bureau of Prison, against uh, what they were doing to us who realized that we were getting sick and closed the unit. Um, Judge Parker was his name, Barrington Parker. And uh, um, we were shipped at that point in different parts of the country. I ended up in a hospital. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a male hospital of the Bureau of Prison in Rochester, New York. Uh, where I was operated because um, I developed a tumor. And so, um, but after uh, the operation, after I think three months of uh, staying in that uh, hospital, I was shipped back to MCC New York because even though the special unit had been closed by Judge Parker, Barrington Parker, the thinking of the BOP hadn't changed. So we were still people that needed to be held in very high security places where um, 
where they where we weren't readily accessible because one of the things that they said uh, during the suit was that they needed to keep us in those conditions uh, because uh, given that we were associated with clandestine organizations, uh, those cl organizations could come and get us. And if they come and get us, we had to be in a prison uh, strong enough that they couldn't be penetrated. But um, this, as far as I'm concerned, was just rhetoric on their part to justify the fact that they were uh, running a long-term ex experiment on isolation on um, with women, with especially uh, 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 using our sexuality against us. Uh, I'll just give an example of what I mean. We had a shower, we had to shower, and there was a camera in front of the shower, and they refused to put... Um, um, a shower curtain. <clears throat> so we refused to take a shower. So then they accused us of stinking and, and smelling and being dirty. And we said, you put a shower curtain and we'll, we'll wash. But until there's a shower curtain, we're not going to take a shower. Right. At that point, I think it was the churches that intervened, uh, the United Council of Churches, and a shower curtain was put. Um, I think... Um, I said this to give an example of the conditions that we were under, which made all the people who, who were there, myself, Alejandrina Torres and Susan Rosenberg, at the end sick. Hmm. And I think um, part of it, I think, we're convinced of this, is that at the time, uh, what they were doing was also a study uh, people rea react under stress conditions because then they refined how they built these special units, no? And they massified these special units. Now they're whole prisons built like on the principles that that small unit, underground unit, was uh, built. Yeah. Um, one name comes to mind, which is Florence, Colorado. It's a whole prison yeah, nice. yeah. based on those things. So we felt very much that we were like guinea pigs uh, for, for that kind of stuff. And also I think they were studying the psychology of women like us. Why would women like us, especially myself, I'll speak only for myself, middle-class, nice, young, white woman, why would she do what she did? And what could they understand about it and the psychology behind it? The only thing that we didn't get from Judge Parker when uh, he ruled, which we all felt was very indicative, was the log books. Hmm. Because they kept log books in which they wrote every and described every single thing that we did, how we reacted to things. And we felt that we didn't get the log books because those log books went somewhere to be studied and analyzed and to be used to, to refine uh, both the question of isolation, but also I think um, an important issue was uh, when people are under stress, Second what is sleep. it that, that makes them weaker or emotional or um, that can be used to then uh, apply pressure on them? we really felt we were like in a major experiment hmm. that, um, that they conducted. And uh, um, I think, I believe uh, um, that was still the case, that I think most people believe that that was an experiment and that they studied the, the logs, they studied these books, they study. Uh, the, the the impressions that people had when they came down because once in a while they would send the psychologist then they would send the chaplain and we would say no we don't want to talk to you but I mean we know that there were assessment about their evaluation of our overall state of health physical and mental and all of that so um, um, 
it was part of the um, really uh, the accumulation of knowledge on their part. I think women for them maybe were a new thing. Uh, I'll say this, why women were a new thing for them. And uh, um, and they there was a very they were very interested in understanding what made us stick. So you had it was you an Italian woman. You had Susan yeah. Rosenberg, a Jewish woman, and, and Alejandrina Torres, who was part of the uh, Puerto Rican political prisoners, the people that Clinton uh, later uh, pardoned, right. and. Um, um, so after that, we we were sent to a number. We were one thing they did is they after Lexington was closed by the decision of uh, the judge Judge Parker Barrington Parker, um, they died. They separated us and sent us all in different directions. Uh, people know the Federal Bureau of Prison as prisons everywhere in the U.S. So uh, Alejandrina was sent to San Diego. I was sent first to Rochester, Minnesota, then to New York. And I don't remember where Susan was sent. But then I was moved to Florida, which was also considered a high security prison. And, uh, and then after a period of time, um, I was moved to Danbury, which was considered... I think a medium security prison. Yeah, so. And uh, but at, by the time I was moved to Danbury, things had somewhat changed because uh, the movement around political prisoners uh, had acquired uh, some weight, especially uh, around the question of the Puerto Rican prisoners. But they, in, they, when they spoke about them, they spoke about all the political prisoners. And um, in Italy, things had started to to change uh, in, around my my question. And uh, it would take a number of years before uh, the U.S. Um, would let me go. But there was already uh, pressure being put on the government by the Italian government to uh, let me finish uh, my prison term in Italy. Let's talk about that because I think it was the uh, uh, the Strasbourg Convention that uh, yes. allowed, yeah, allowed uh, prisoners to be returned to their uh, home country. Country of to, origin. Yeah, to, uh, to, uh, to finish their trial. I wish they had that for Africans who were enslaved, you know, if they can have us return back to our country of origin, but that's a whole other story. Um, how did that take well, place? That would because, be an interesting concept to find amen. about. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, right now imperialism is imperialism, so wherever we get sent, it's going to be a problem. But, exactly. Uh, so, so, so you, I mean, and 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 you've been living in in the um, the fascist state of Italy since then, mm -hmm. correct? Um, and and I want to I want to ask you about the difference in fascism there, but I, I want to rewind before I go there. How did um, it all take place. How did this transfer? Because we know that it was a movement, it was a fight. And I want to say definitely um, rise in power to folks like Toby. I want you to talk about mm -hmm. Toby if you get the opportunity. But um, you know, how did this this transfer take place, and how long did it take? Okay. Uh, my lawyer, my second lawyer was Elizabeth Fink. Yes, rise in power. People Elizabeth. know. Yes because she defended the Attica brothers. She was one of the lawyers that defended the Attica brothers. And it was actually her idea to say, look, you'll never get out in the US. Let's see if we can get you transferred to a jail in Italy. Mm, so she, 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 put, she put that in uh, motion. I have to say that an important role was played also by my sister who worked at the, at the European Commission in Brussels. And she approached a number of Europe, Italian European parliamentarians who, who um, and got them interested in my situation, which I think got easier to do 
with the with after Lexington because of the condition in Lexington, because of the health issue, uh, because of the isolation that we were under for almost two years, all of that. Um, so, uh, but uh, Italy had never approved the Strasbourg Convention. So there was a, a whole first stage that didn't involve me directly, uh, which was to the, uh, the Italian parliament to approve the Strasbourg Convention to integrate it into the laws of the country. And then I could request to be transferred to my country of origin because that's the essence of the transfer of the Strasbourg Convention. That process, all of it took 12 years and uh, took 12 years uh, because of the uh, attitude of the US government. It took 12 years because initially the Italian government wasn't so sure they wanted to request me to go back to Italy. Um, it took time for it, for the support movement or solidarity movement in Italy to acquire uh, the consistency and the power to put real pressure on the government. And, um, but also I think other things intervened that were used strategically to move uh, the issue. Uh, an important issue was that Clinton wanted to use um, a number of Air Force bases in the northeast corner of Italy to bomb Yugoslavia. And he was allowed to do that. And so when my issue of going back to Italy came up again, the prime minister at the time made him, um, uh, made him realize that maybe he owed them something. And I think that was part of the issue that finally allowed me to come back to Italy. Hmm. There was also, I don't know if people remember, there were a number of issues in that year. Uh, these two Air Force guys uh, played with a plane and ended up um, killing a number of people because they ended up hitting a ski lift. And, yeah, right. and uh, the Italian government didn't prosecute them, uh, but allowed them to go back to the U.S. where they were never, they never served a day of time after killing six people. And people were very angry about that in Italy. And so that also put pressure on the Italian government. You just let those two guys go, do something about her. So, but it took a long time. And, um, and uh, it finally happened in August of 1999. How much time did you end up serving in Italy once you were transferred? Um, I did uh, two years and something uh, under jail and hospital because I got sick again and I had a second tumor. Mm -hmm. And then I did almost six years of house arrest. Mm -hmm. Because of my health, they decided that I shouldn't go back to prison, but I should uh, be under house arrest. I actually on paper, did almost every day of my sentence, which wow. under the old law was 26 years. I was sentenced to 44, but because of the old law, it it uh, translated itself into 26 years. Hmm. Yeah, so you were released in, what was that, 2000? 2006, September 2006. Eight, I think eight months short of what my release date would have been and I done all of it. Wow, wow. Well, we, we are happy you out. And not That's only so that, funny. yeah, I'm quite sure you are. <laughs> um, yeah. It took I, me a while to get used to it, but yes, I'm very happy to be out. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I, I could imagine. But, um, but, but you know, I mean, one, one of the things that, that we respect uh, about you and and say cool and Jalil, I think Jalil's in the chat right now. And the Ruba, and shout out to the Ruba, um, because I know that um Liz Fink was also shout out to Liz Fink was also his lawyer. And yes, one of the on the red people, squad suit. Yes, one of the primary people responsible for getting him out. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I want to say I have uh, to mention Bob Boyle. Yes, definitely Bob. When you're Boyle. talking about the Ruba's lawyer, because yes, I know he still represents him. 
Yeah, and I and I know Bob still has a headache. Shout out to Bob, you know, Dylan mm. Um, <laughs> we've had Bob on the platform as well. So, mm. you know, definitely uh, uh Bob. Um I wanna I wanna uh first I, I know that Daruba, speaking of Daruba, he was just out uh in Rome and you all got to got to uh connect. Um how was that? Because I know he was telling me that he you know he wants to work hard on solidarity. You know, was that the first time you had saw him since your um since you all's released or release? No, I saw Daruba when he was released from the Panther 21, right? And then I even went to some court dates and a couple of times before my arrest, I visited him in prison at MCC New York. Mm. Um, but uh, no, when he came to Rome, it was the first time I'd seen him since my arrest, which was in 82. Wow. Wow. So, uh, but he looks more or less the same. Right. Right. He hasn't... He hasn't changed much. No, I, I want to say something about the Ruba coming to Rome because um, uh, it was important. First of all, I think the protest movement, um, which at times is uh, described as Black Lives Matter, but as far as I understand and from what I've read was a lot more complex than just the organization. There's been a lot of interest uh, in the Italy for what was going on in the US. And there's also a big problem with racism in Italy. Um, um, one aspect of it, very important, is the fact that second generation, uh, the children of African immigrants who were born in Italy um, do not automatically get citizenship. So we have a number of people, young people in particular, who have only known this country, who are not citizens of this country because, uh, because uh, citizenship in Italy is uh, what they call by blood. And um, so, but you have a number of Argentinians who never even seen Italy, who have the right to become uh, Italian citizens because they're descendants of Italian immigrants. Hmm. So um, this is this has uh, fueled in the last few years a very interesting uh, movement of what they call second gen the second generation. Who are uh, who organized a major demonstration in support of the movement after George Floyd in the U.S., but who have taken that starting point uh, as a way to organize themselves for dealing with the situation here. So, the Ruba coming here was also important for that reason because he got to meet a number of the young people involved in that. Uh, I th I hope. I think they exchanged uh, connections and stuff. And it was also important uh, for everybody in terms of uh, hearing his perspective, because it's not a perspective that necessarily you hear every day in Italy. Um, um, and uh, he has an experience, he has a history that goes way back. We're talking 40 years now, uh, 50 years uh, of struggle and so uh, he brings he brings a lot to the table and I think uh, people responded well I think some people wanted to get more into it but it was hard to get more into it, uh, it when there are 300 people a crowd of 300 people uh, who listen and participate so it was many levels of uh, of uh, want to call it radicals present at the at the public meeting with Daruba, uh, but I think for young people, for people who have never even had the experience 
of meeting uh, with a member of the Black Liberation Movement or someone like the Ruba, it was really uh, an important uh, encounter. And I hope uh, more things will come out of it in, uh, as time goes on. Um, the Ruba's health permitting and uh, because Clearly, he, he, he has health issues. And, um, but I, from our perspective, it, it went well. Clearly, uh, even more would have been, would have been better. Uh, but it was what it was. It was um, initial uh, getting in touch and, um, we hope there will be more in the future. Yeah. If not with the Ruba, with somebody else who represents the black struggle. And the Ruba is this uh, interesting thing, no? Because he lives in some in the U.S., but also he lives in Africa. So yeah. he has a, that perspective too. Because right. part of the time he's in Ghana, part of the time he's in the U.S. And that adds to it. Because clearly, um, one of the issues in Italy, historically speaking, is the fact that Italy still hasn't uh, uh, dealt with its colonial past. Hmm. You know, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Libya, part of the disaster in Libya. Yes. Italy is intimately involved with that. And so, um, you know, it's important. It's important that, that if it helps that conversation move in the right direction too. I know. Well, we are at, at Black Power Media. We hope to play a role in keeping this, this line of communication. Um, Absolutely. Yes, yes. I will talk to the radio station again. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, I don't know, uh, did Voice Scott get in touch with you? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't heard from them yet, but- um. Okay, I, I will make sure they get in touch with you. No doubt. I we, promise. We, yeah, no, it's cool. We, 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 we definitely want to keep that that cross in international airways rolling hard because um, you know it's important and, and I'm, I'm very grateful on behalf of our audience and our platform that you took time. I know it's a six hour difference over in Italy right now. Um, you're six hours ahead of us. And um, you know, it's, it's definitely um, an honor to have you on and I'm looking forward to having you back on. So this is gonna be a, uh, a, a, a last uh, uh, visit, you know, so. Let's make sure that that happens. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I thank you for inviting me. Without a doubt, without a doubt. I want to ask um, in closing, um, mm -hmm. when we talk about, you know, the the sacrifice, right? Because as you mentioned, you were pretty much, uh, you know, you all weren't doing too bad uh, financially here in the United States. Um, you know, if, you know, everything was cool and you know, all of a sudden you want to get down with this, this whole, you know, black liberation movement and this, you know, uh, Puerto Rican liberation movement. You know, I asked, you know, with all the, the, the time served, 26 years behind the wall, the trials, um, watching your comrades be tortured and um, uh, uh, arrested and given so many years, um, are there any regrets? On my part? Yes. Absolutely not. That's no, I mean, I, I've had up, ups and downs. It's not been a straight line at all. Right up, right up. But no, absolutely not. And I have to say that in the last few years, considering all the conversations that have been going on, very important conversations as far as I'm concerned, uh, I felt... I felt that um, what was done uh, was not only necessary, but can help the conversation today. Right on, right on. Well, um, as they say, thank you for your service. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me on the radio station. Yes, on the yes. platform, it's not a radio station. Sorry, it's, it's all good. We we have goals. We'll be going through the through the through the Italian airwaves soon as well. So okay, not, so you, you just spoke it into existence. So it's all good. But um, definitely salute to you, Revolutionary Love. 
continue to fight. And, um, you know, anytime you need uh, to put any information out, uh, let us know. Daruba's in the yes. chat right now. He just sent you a message. I'm going to put it up here. He said, Comrade Sylvia, building solidarity. Solidarity is ongoing. Yeah, so you know he's going to put it Okay, he did it in his way. Yes, yes, <laughs> I got yes, it. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and uh, I think Jalil and some of the others are in the chat as well. Uh -huh. You know, and they all send revolutionary greetings and love. And um, it's good. I, in closing, I want to say. Um, I, can I, I say a word? Please, Just, you, you, say, you say 10 words if you want. No, good. I wanted to mention that one of the things that we're trying to, to resolve in Italy is the fact that there are people in prison uh, who belong to the Red Brigades for uh, it's 40 years that they're in prison. And very much, we talked. the The program started with talking about Mumia, no, and this in intractability after so many years in prison about letting some people go. Well, this is the situation with about twenty members of the Red Brigades who have taken the position of uh, absolutely not recognizing the state and therefore not negotiating, not signing anything. And so one of the things that we're, that we're trying to do, some of us are trying to do, is raise the issue of why are these people in jail after all this time? Can, can you uh, please, uh, you know, for our viewers who are not familiar with the Red Brigade, can you give us some backstory on it? And um, I know that sounds the same elsewhere, we did an interview with, uh, Laura Whitehorn talking about mm -hmm. the May 19 communist organization, mm -hmm. but if you can um, touch on uh, the Red Brigade in regards to who the Red Brigade is and what their fight and struggle is about. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Red Brigade started in the uh, late 60s, early 70s in Italy, and it was an armed clandestine organization. Um, I think it was the largest armed clandestine organization in Europe. Uh, it was quite, um, it also had a, a, a fairly large uh, periphery uh, that allowed it to move and act. Uh, and uh, they had um, the objective of uh, promoting a revolutionary struggle in, in Italy and um, they did a number of very uh, important actions. Uh, the one most famous probably is when they kidnapped the prime minister of Italy, Aldo Moro. And, but not only that, they did a number of actions uh, that had to do with um, um, organiz uh, organiz the organization of work in the factories, that had to do with the political system in Italy, that had to do with the prisons, and uh, and had to do with the U.S. too, because at some point they <clears throat> took General Dozier, who was a representative of NATO in Italy, and held him in, in a people's jail for a number of years. So a number of their, most of their people have been in jail. I think there were over 3,000 people arrested and served time. Uh, have been released one way or the other, but there's a group of over 20 people that absolutely refuse to recognize the existence of the Italian state and government, and therefore will not sign any um, letter and uh, or acknowledge the existence of uh, their counterparts, the government. And so uh, I think um, this has made it easier for people to forget that they're in prison. And what we're trying to do in this period is to remind pe people that they're absolutely in prison, that it's been 40 years, and that uh, they should be able to get out of prison without compromising their position. Because after 40 years, what else is there to do? Right, right. I want, I want to definitely... Uh, uh, connect with you um, about bringing some of the uh, uh, former political prisoners and uh, fighters from the Red Brigade on as well to uh, tell their story. Oh, you know, this is a- uh, Well, if you want, I can give you, uh, I will send it to you, uh, names and numbers and addresses okay. so you can get in touch with them. 
Okay, so we both have homework to do. I both have homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I appreciate yes. you, Sylvia. We, thank we will, you. Thank you. Yes, and thank yes. the brother who left. Yes, yes, Dr. Ball. Indeed, indeed. So we, we'll definitely be uh, in touch. Stay on the right side of history. And okay. um, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you. You're checking out Riot Starter TV. That was Sylvia Baraldini. Listen, if you tapped in late, you slipping, go back, check out the whole piece. Matter of fact, if you've been here the whole time, check out the whole piece because, you know, um, it is, I think it's worth it. Um, do us a favor and share this uh, um, this particular broadcast. And if you, um, if you so have it in your heart, we have a lot more uh, heavy duty um, interviews and, and programs coming up here at Black Power Media. So make sure you continue to support our work and our efforts, support our movement, um, support our organization. The organization is uh, FTP Movement. Um, and you can find us at thepeoplesarmy.org, thepeoplesarmy.org. Um, again, we thank you all for supporting our work. Continue to stay on the right side of the barricades, and we coming, we rumbling. Stay ready for revolution. Riot Starter TV, we out. <laughs>